All right, so I'm Mark from UCSD. This was work that I did in conjunction with my advisors, uh, Ranjit and Soren. And um, as he said, printing floating point numbers, a faster, always correct method. Now, a little change to this. We, uh, we were informed three days ago that there is a critical uh, mistake made in our benchmarks and that instead of being what we thought was about two times faster than the previous algorithm, our algorithm is about, is a little worse than half as fast as the previous algorithm. Now, fortunately, the uh, main contribution of our algorithm is the always correct uh, portion of the title. So, starting now, I will present to you printing floating point numbers in always correct method. Okay, so the first question is, why printing floating point numbers? I mean, this, this seems like, can't be too difficult of a problem. So to, to motivate this, I'm gonna start with an example. You could, you could even follow along in a Python console. You, you type in 0 0.1, and it returns to you 0 0.1. You type in 0 0.2, it returns to you 0 0.2, and then you try adding 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, and that number comes up. And you might be convinced that maybe you have a compiler bug, but in fact, I'm gonna tell you that this is the correct answer. And so, correctness. This is actually a very difficult um, topic in, with regards to floating point numbers, so I'm, I'm gonna go over exactly what it means to correctly print a floating point number. So, starting here, we have the real number line. This is the, the all the real numbers, and on this, I'll put V. V here is a specific floating point number. It takes a discrete point on the real number line. Then we have a previous and next floating point number. So this is the number before V. There's no floating point numbers between previous and V, and there's no floating point numbers between V and next. Next, we can denote some midpoints between these floating point numbers, and then what we say is that this entire range in blue maps to V. So this, the floating point number essentially owns this range of V. And so the question comes up, all right, if we're given V then, what number do we print? We can print anything in the blue region it would map to V. All those are in some sense a correct conversion. Perhaps we just choose the number V itself, but it could be 0.1, a lot of zeros, five, 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 it keeps going on. And so that might not be an ideal number to print. So instead, in this range, there is a number 0.1. You know, if the user entered 0.1, we'd probably want to return to them that the number is 0.1. And so the, the definition we have for correctness here is that we want to pick the shortest number in this range. All right, so what challenges are there to printing floating point numbers? So I'm gonna start by picking on JavaScript here because in JavaScript, every number is a floating point number. You might think you're using integers, but really, integers are just cleverly disguised floating point numbers. And so JavaScript cares a lot about this in terms of accuracy, like I said before, printing the correct number, as well as speed. And then we can look at other languages like Rust and Python, and Python's an interesting case because they actually, in their bug report when looking at the previous algorithm, focused on an idea of simplicity, how complicated is the printing floating point algorithm. So this is, a, this is another aspect that we care about. All right, so I'm gonna use a timeline, it'll serve as our outline for this talk. So up here, we'll start with the classical algorithm, and this was by Steele and White in 1990, and the main key aspect of this algorithm was that it was 100% correct. It always produced the correct output, but it wasn't very fast. Then in 2010, Florian Loisch made an approximate algorithm, which was 99.5% correct. But it was 12 and a half times faster. And so essentially by losing a little bit of correctness, he was able to create an algorithm that far, far outperformed the previous algorithm. And then lastly, we'll come to our algorithm, which we again recover being 100% correct, but we're only 5.2 times faster than the classical algorithm. So we're, we do lose speed to the uh, approximate algorithm, but we're recovering this 100% um, correct property. All right, so we're gonna start with the classical algorithm. And the classical algorithm is called Dragon 4, like I said, by Steele and White in 1990. 
And the big feature of it is it uses big integer arithmetic, or arbitrary integer arithmetic. And as a consequence of this choice, it, it is relatively slow. For certain numbers, it can take a while to process. But it's always correct. It always gives you the best answer possible. And to sort of cover briefly how the, the in a high level, how this works, like I said, the, the goal is really, all right, we have some interval, and there's some shortest number in this interval, and we want to select the shortest number. And to, so what we essentially do is we want to sort of scan over this interval in some way, very precisely, so that we can figure out what the shortest is and return that. And that's the Dragon 4 algorithm. Now, <clears throat> moving on, we move on to the approximate algorithm. And this algorithm is called Grishu 3. It was uh, made by Florian Loisch in 2010. And instead of using these big arbitrary sized integers, they switched to using 64-bit integers. And this makes it much faster. But on 0.5% of inputs, it can't guarantee you that it'll give the best output. It'll, it'll in, in fact, inform you that this isn't the best output. And if you want the best output, you can then fall back to the Dragon algorithm to once again recover 100% um, correctness. So I'm gonna talk a bit about how the Grishu 3 approximation works. So previously I said we, we need to cover this region, and I'm gonna use an analogy to uh, using like a paintbrush. So, we, we essentially want to cover this entire range from A to B, and Dragon does this very precisely. And you can think of it as like a very small brush that moves across. But a very small brush is very slow. You wouldn't want to use a small brush to cover, you know, to paint a wall. You'd want to use something else. So Grishu instead uses a much larger brush. And in this way, it's able to scan over the interval very quickly. But like a much larger brush, it's, it can be difficult to sort of color in between the lines accurately. So instead of this con very you know, high confidence interval, it's sort of blurry on the sides. And what we, what we can say is, well, even though we use this large brush, there is a, is a smaller region that we, that we must cover. When we paint, we know we at least cover this region, but then there's a larger region where maybe we got some paint on that region. Maybe we, we colored outside the lines a little bit. And so what this does is this gives us sort of an interval where we're not sure on the ends where exactly the ends of the interval are. And this can pose a problem, so because you could say, what if we painted outside the line and covered a number that wasn't in the range A to B? We'll, we'll produce the wrong number, let alone maybe not even the shortest. So the solution to this is first, we want to perform some kind of under approximation. So essentially, we're still going to make this fast stroke, but instead, we're going to make sure that no matter what, it falls within the interval A to B. And when we do this, we'll call this the narrow interval. And essentially, when we do this, we'll get a narrow result that we know falls in the range A to B. But we want to do better, so we also perform an over approximation. Essentially, we once again, paint across this line, but we do it in a way that we make sure we cover the entire interval A to B, and this gives us a wide interval. Again, we're still not sure exactly where the edge of those intervals are, and with the wide interval, we then get a wide result. So how do we, how do we use these things to check to make sure that we did the right thing? So what you essentially do is you compare the two. You make sure if they both produce the same length number, then we did good. We will just return the narrow result. Now, the, if we didn't, what we're essentially saying is we're not sure if this was the, if the narrow result is the best because there could be a shorter number outside of it. And let's, let's use a couple, uh, pair of specific intervals. So say we painted this narrow interval and that wide interval. What we see is that there's some space that's uncovered, essentially. And if a short number falls within this space, we're not confident in our answer. And for Grishu, this uncovered space is small enough that it's correct 99.5% of the time, which is pretty good, but 0.5% of the time, we don't know. So that, that's the Grishu algorithm, which we'll now move on to our algorithm how we, and how we recover 100% correctness. So our algorithm is called ARL, and there's three main ideas behind it. First, 
we use a double-double intermediate format. Second, we then fix common failures. And then third, we fix what we call rare failures. But to start, let's look at the double-double format. So double-doubles are a, con a common concept that you can see in uh, uh, the art of computer programming. And to briefly go over it, let's, let's think if we have pi with five-digit floating point numbers, essentially. So with five digits, we can write pi like this. But if we want more precision, what we can do is we can take another floating point number, and if we add these two numbers, we now get pi to 10 digits. Now, you can't actually add the two numbers because it would round to five numbers, so you just carry around two floating point numbers and use their unevaluated sum. And what, what this does is this gives you double the precision, and it's a relatively fast way of performing high precision arithmetic. Now, before when, when I showed this, I said Grishu had 99 point, was 99.5% correct. 99.5% of the time, it produces the shortest number. But for our algorithm, we're able to shrink these regions by improving the amount, of, increasing the amount of precision we have. And by doing this, the first version of Errol is 99.97% correct. Only 0.03% of the time do we have to use another algorithm to recover correctness. And using uh, the double-double precision, we're 3.5 times faster than the Dragon algorithm. This is still slower than Grishu, though. So we're at 99.97% correct, so let's see if we can do better and correct some of these common failures. So the first thing to do that, we wanted to look and classify errors. And this plot here, what we did is on the x-axis, x -axis, what you're seeing is a fixed exponent. And then within a fixed exponent, we generated random numbers and saw how many failures we saw. There, we, we determined how many failures there were. Now, you'll see that Grishu has failures all over the place. However, with Errol, you don't see basically any errors until you get to a certain point. And so this intrigued us, and if we zoom in on this, we'll see that we get a lot of failures, up to 20% of the time, in fact, but it's all clustered around about an exponent of 60. Now, one of the nice things about these specific numbers is that they're relatively small integers. And since they're relatively small integers, we can just quickly use an integer conversion algorithm. And with integer conversion, it's an exact algorithm, so we can produce the smallest number exactly in this region, <clears throat> improving our uh, accuracy. In the end, it's still 3.5 times faster, but we've now improved the accuracy to 99.9999. You know, I, I tested on over 10 billion numbers and not a single one failed. And all right, you know, five nines might be good enough for somebody like Google, but here at Popple, we wanna be sure our number is correct. So next we want to see if we could fix rare failures. So, First, the, let's look at the set of all doubles. So the input to our program can be any double precision floating point number. Now, the, the set of all doubles, this blue region here, is far too large to enumerate. Even when I said I tested 10 billion numbers, that's still only one ten billionth of the entire input space. So we don't really have any shot at trying to enumerate all these numbers. However, if we were to find failures, we would, find, we, we would find failures, but they would be confined to a small region of the input space. <clears throat> so, how do we characterize these failures? What, what is this special property that makes up the green region? Oh, sorry. So, with this, we can ignore the blue region and focus only on the green region. And the question is, what makes up this green region? So, first we started by characterizing failures. And we produced a, a couple of theorems that do exactly this, and it's based off of a bunch of modular arithmetic and, and relatively large powers. But, <clears throat> but given numbers that satisfy this theorem, we know that those numbers could fail. Not that they must fail, but it's possible that they fail. And if they don't satisfy this condition, they will not fail. Now, this, this isn't a very actionable statement, so we then abstracted the problem to what we call the pathological constraint problem. 
And this is a much simpler problem. It's, it's easier to state and it's also easier to solve. And using, <clears throat> and based off the pathological constraint problem, we're able to write an algorithm that enumerates all possible failures. It enumerates every number that satisfies this condition. So with enumerating failures, this green region, this region is small enough that we can enumerate all of them. It's not that large region of billions of billions of numbers, it's relatively small. And when we actually enumerated all of them, we then tested every single one of these inputs, and what we discovered is that 141 numbers failed, which is a relatively small number. In fact, it's small enough that we are able to handle it by simply adding in a table of corrected values. So if we get one of these 141 inputs, just output the right value. And with this, we guarantee that we correctly convert all the numbers. And since we correctly convert every single number, we get this awesome property that we don't even need to check if we correct, converted correctly, since it's guaranteed by the uh, math proof shown before. So, with this, without having to correct, to, or without having to check, we're now 5.2 times faster, and again, we have recovered 100% correctness. And once again, just to uh, conclude and wrap up, we started with a classical algorithm, 100% correct, and we moved on to an approximate algorithm that did sacrifice a little bit of correctness for a lot of speed. And then we bring in our algorithm where we do make a trade-off, we do sacrifice some speed, but we then use this to once again achieve 100% correct conversion. All right. With that, I want to thank you and Open up to questions. Quads, and what about arbitrary precision floating point numbers? I'm sorry, what was that? What about quad, quad precision, like 128 bits? And uh, can you, so, I mean, essentially the question is about the table. How does the table scale if you have a higher precision? So float? you should have approximately the same number as, this, as the precision scales. Because you, you'll get about one, statistically, if it was a perfectly random distribution, which it's not, you get about one error per exponent. Which, so it would scale a little bit with the exponent, but if you know, with like quad precision, the exponent doesn't get as much larger as the uh, significant. That gets much larger. So I would like to try this on quads to experimentally verify. So I'm concerned about the um, variance in the runtime of the algorithm, particularly those 144. If I'm on a, on a real-time system, for example, you might do good performance on average, but I might care about your worst case. Yeah, so the, the performance does vary. I did actually bring, have a backup slide of the performance, so mm. this is perfect. So there, there's a number of things to, to sort of point out here. <laughs> so, okay, first of all, in gray is the performance of Grishu. And you'll notice that it's generally faster, but when it fails, you do have to fall back to another out. They, they fall back to Dragon 4, and that's what you're seeing with this gray V. Now, ours, on the other hand, um, what you see on the, so when I said you do an integer conversion in the middle, that's this middle portion here, which is sometimes faster, sometimes slower. Um, the addition, this is a, there's a fixed point, uh, there's a fixed point algorithm that I added later. And then there's problems on the side. So yeah, this doesn't give you good real you know, guarantees about the speed at which you can convert. Now, if you're willing to sacrifice maybe not getting the shortest number, you can use, there's a version of Grishu uh, called Grishu 2, which doesn't care about this. There's a version here, you can just remove the checking, in fact, just use the narrow bounds. And those will give you a much more reliable timing um, and they will be fast as well. Uh, do you also have a plot on the uh, grouping of those 140? Like, where are they in this space? What do they look like? They're, they're generally up near the, they're just almost seemingly randomly distributed near the top of the range. Um, it, it, it's kind of just luck that those values don't succeed because if, if it were just like a random distribution, it's just luck that, it has to do with how close a midpoint is to a short number. And so sometimes they're very close. 
So as I recall, one of the issues in the original you know, printing floating point was correct rounding, so that if you round trip under a rounding mode, you, know, you get the right thing. When you're using this double-double you know, representation, you're, you're going to be sensitive to the current rounding mode. So does this extend you know, to round up, round down? Yeah, so this might affect the, um, the table of values. So regardless, you still get a lot of precision. You still roughly sure. double the precision. And this is, this is an experiment I should probably run, which is just try every rounding mode and see what tables it produces. Are they the same? And then also, we could take the union of all of those sure. to cover right, every right. rounding mode. As it is, this is the default rounding mode when you compile the C program. Hi, uh, Jacques-Henri Jourdan from Indria Paris. Um, I would like to understand why, what is happening with these integer, um, relatively small integer numbers. I'm sorry, what was that? Well, there is this special case you're doing with uh, small integers. Uh, like why, or how do I do it? Well, you say that uh, you, for, for small integers, uh, you're doing a, a special case. Yeah, it, it has to do with the fact that in small integers, the failures are extraordinarily common. And the, the reason why is even as you increase precision, you can't cover those values. What essentially happens is for small integers, the shortest number is very often the midpoint itself. So even as you reduce the uncovered space, that midpoint is, never, is always going to be in the uncovered space. So essentially, you need to do some type of integer conversion, some precise conversion for those numbers. There's a, there's a theorem we have in our uh, paper that shows that in fact, once you reach an exponent of 130, midpoints themselves can no longer be the cause of failure. So you don't need to use an integer conversion past that point. <clears throat> um, could you make the Grishno freer whatever algorithm faster? Or correct by just calling the, you know, always correct algorithm if it fails, and then it would be both faster it would be faster than yours, presumably, and always correct? So say, using Grishu and falling back to Errol? Exactly. Yes, yes, that is a, an option. So instead of falling back to Dragon, you can fall back to our algorithm, and that would recover the, the okay. uh, always correct aspect. OK. Is that Vimes's Dragon? What's that? Errol, is it Vimes' is Dragon? It, it's um, from Terry Pratchett. Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> so the last thing, I'm curious about that uptick at the high exponents, which seems a little bit odd because high exponents are exact integers. Yes, so <laughs> what's happening there is there, there's a step that you have to do where you essentially need to normalize the number. You need to bring it into the range 1 to 10. And we can't perform that in one step precisely with a very large number. It has to do with the fact that the, you, you use a lookup table of powers of 10, essentially, to perform a giant division. And once you reach that large of a number, that table, you, you just run out of precision. You can't perform the division. Um, so we perform one division and then iteratively divide the rest. We could probably optimize, I didn't, I didn't work on it, where you just perform two table lookups to perform the division. Um, so, uh, can you explain again how do you uh, 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 get these random numbers? So, these are just ran so I just essentially used rand to generate a bunch of bits. And then I checked it, and then I just turned it into a floating point number and verified to make sure it was a valid floating point number. So, makes sense. throwing away anything that, you know, infinity nan, all those. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, th this was the benchmark that I wrote. So those, those are with respect to the original Dragon algorithm, the Dragon 4 algorithm. Oh, just randomly tested. It's a micro benchmark, testing how long it takes to convert a single number. 